Good evening and welcome. <clears throat> welcome to our front porch. We consider our front porch an on, informal school where we share our collective wisdom. So this past summer, I heard a knock on my door and I found two city workers who were doing a survey of the homes to document the lead pipes in our community. My 1920 bungalow house, lead pipes were included in that survey. A week later, in my yard, I found water leaking and it ended up that the pipes had corroded and needed to be replaced. As this was happening, uh, we had just finished reading What the Eyes Will See, Don't See, um, and it was being a, a book was being, the book was being considered for the One Book, One Community Festival. So as you can imagine, I was pretty concerned. Um, and there are many people that helped me navigate that. And it was sort of the seed of us deciding to do this program because I felt it was, it was important to have good information to make the decisions that we have to need. We need to go forward, not only personally in our own homes, but for the community as well. So it has been really a wonderful time working on this committee with Jan and, and Virginia and a bunch of other people. It's really bringing together a way to look at arts and community issues from from the arts to music to science. And so I, it's been a wonderful experience, so thank you. Um, and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jan now to tell us a little bit more about that. Actually, our, our One Book, One Community Committee was really great to work with. And we're still working with it because we have a whole month of activities ahead of us. But I wanna say that when we were, in, last summer, when I, when I brought this up to the uh, Shared Community Action Group, um, the idea of water as a theme was immediately, uh, got a, an immediate positive response. No questions about, oh, we can't do this. I mean, what, water? Uh, no, it was very, very positive. And the people there at that meeting all had some connection with quality of water or some something to do with water, as of course we would, right? We, we need it for life. Uh, but then it got to the point of, we need a book that will serve our purposes for this water theme. And that was a, a struggle, actually. I don't know how many books we read, but when we fin finally found what the eyes don't see, we all agreed, this is it. And the rest is history, right? So we were talking about that. We were asking book clubs to adopt the book uh, and to make it really a central issue in terms of our own uh, lives in Macomb as individuals, but also as a community. So here we are, um, and we will have the, uh, some our guests from um, Michigan with us, and with the help of um, Chris Merritt, we, will, we hope this will be a discussion, but I want to recognize Mayor Ma Mike Inman. Do you want to say hello? <laughs> hello. Uh, uh, I just want to thank Dan and obviously uh, the folks here at the museum for collaborating on this, this One Book, One Community Festival. And as and Jane indicated, our um, Shared Community Action Group thought this was a great topic, and I'm glad to see that you all think it is too. It's important to discuss. And Dr. Merritt, it's always great to... Uh, Good group. to see you, Mayor Mike. <laughs> okay, we'll let Chris. You can take it from here. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks to Sue, uh, Sue Scott, and uh, and Janice. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to be here. Um, what I thought we would do. Oh, first of all, I should just ask: Does everyone have a handout? I think uh, in my professorial, to make sure everyone has the syllabus, everyone has the handout. Uh, I'm going to talk for maybe five minutes. We'll see as a professor, I can actually stick to that. Um, and then I want to give the bulk of the time to our colleagues at the University of Michigan, Flint. And again, I'm very th uh, thankful that they're able to make time from the Eastern time zone uh, to talk to us tonight. Um, th they'll talk maybe 30 to 40 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for a conversation. Um, I have questions prepared, but we would like to prioritize the questions you have 
because they're going to talk about the work that they're doing in downtown Flint now, including work on uh, the water issues, but also economic development in terms of recovery. And they're very interested in talking about how the work that they're doing intersects with the book that, uh, that you've read. So um, what I would thought I would do is to, is to start with a, just a few uh, comments about the themes that I uh, recognize. And, and I'll just say that um, my title is you know, Dean for Innovation and Economic Development, but, but maybe more importantly, uh, Director of the Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs. And in that role, uh, at least when I wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm going to make the world a slightly better place. At least that's what I think I'm going to do. Uh, and after reading the book, I think that's sort of aligned with what the book is doing. And I think very much what our uh, friends from uh, the University of Michigan Flint are also engaged in trying to make the world a slightly better place. So it's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about, uh, you know, some of the themes, well, obviously the central theme is water. But of course, when we talk about uh, unsafe water and that people don't have access to safe water, we understand then that the theme of water, bad water, uh, uh, spills, so to speak, uh, into many other issues and themes, including racism and environmental justice. Um, community leadership, I think the, uh, the author makes uh, in several instances, you know, points out that just regular folks in regular neighborhoods were some of the people who are speaking up and it reminds me of a Henry, Henry uh, Ibsen quote. Um, he said that a community is like a ship, that everyone should be prepared to take the helm. And so this is uh, interesting to me, at least, um, that in times of crisis, often leadership comes from surprising places. And so I thought that was a, uh, a very nice theme. Uh, early childhood development and uh, the idea of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and then uh, something that uh, we saw uh, time and again is the importance of science and the scientific method. And, you know, somebody who works at a university, uh, you know, somebody who, who taught the philosophy of science and understood, under, at least I think I understand the scientific method and thinking about people who do their science on Facebook. Uh, I love the idea that we are reminded how important uh, a belief in science is uh, to our well-being and to democracy. And that was, to me, a very powerful message. Uh, there's also the issue of good government. Um, and what it means to have ethical behavior uh, exhibited by our uh, uh, trusted public servants. Uh, the issue of trickle-down economics. I mean, I guess I had thought about it as being a public health issue, maybe. Well, because, you know, it's widening income gaps and so forth. But this book really brings it home that trickle-down economics, the commitment to austerity measures, uh, does have these public health implications. And, and that's, uh, I think, ultimately what the author blames the situation on in, um, in Flint. Uh, and that reminded me of a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who says taxes, by the way, I hate paying taxes, but on the other hand, I like paying taxes. And here's the quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, and maybe you know this one, taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. So I mean, nobody likes to pay taxes, but it's like going to the Y, right? Uh, you wouldn't expect to go into YMCA and, and have access to the pool and the gym and all those sorts of things. You pay a membership. And to me, that's what taxes are. It's your membership to a civilized society. And so, which is, you know, sort of counter the idea of austerity economics. Um, on the back page of the handout, and I shared this also when I'm looking at this, um, our friends from Michigan aren't there. Um, on the back of the handout is uh, um, a map that I, and of course I'm a geographer and I know we're gonna have somebody who does GIS, love maps, love geography. And I, in previous years, I had taught, uh, taught courses on sort of world development. And, um, and so, you know, as sort of a, a bell ringer, as my wife would say, she teaches fourth grade, you know, what's an attention grabber at the beginning of a class? And I would show this map. And the idea for me was, you know, do you need a shorthand measure for what is a developed country versus what is a developing country? And, and my shorthand answer was, well, a country is developed if you can drink the water out of the tap. And so, and that, you know, the CDC, uh, you know, if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll see that's not exactly what the CDC says, but again, as sort of a, a shorthand measure, the map is showing you where you can, with, with a high level of confidence, they think at least, where you can drink uh, water out of the tap. And yet we read a book which kind of gives lie to that data, right? So now I'm gonna have to rethink my use of this map because clearly, 
uh, there's a nuance, which is what the map actually says. You know, we have to be careful with these kinds of generalizations, even in uh, you know, the wealthiest economy, wealthiest country in the world, uh, not every place has access to the things that we take for granted as sort of middle-class uh, residents of America. Um, so um, what I'd like to do now is, and I'm going to guess we're going to have um, uh, showing our guests here, I'd like to introduce uh, the, uh, my friends and colleagues from the University of Michigan Flint. Um, I was I visited uh, these uh, colleagues last year, and I was it was remarkable to me to see that University of Michigan Flint is very close to the Flint River, and um, um, they um, are part of the team that has EDA Economic Development Administration money to help uh, sort of jumpstart the economy in downtown Flint. So they're part of the recovery process. Um, and you know, just as an aside, as a University of Michigan Flint, right, it's a regional public university like WIU. So I think we're kindred spirits in that way. So um, we have Paula Naz, um, and Paula is a lawyer and director of the University of Michigan Flint's Office of Economic Development. Nick Custer, who's Innovation Services Manager for UM Flint uh, Office of Economic Development. And then Troy Rosencrantz, who leads the GIS Center at University of Michigan Flint. And then one final story, uh, as I mentioned, I met Paula because she was hosting an event last year uh, in collaboration with the Brookings Institution that in fact was focused on the sort of the underappreciation and the huge value of regional public universities. Um, and so I traveled over and I stayed in downtown Flint and there was a, there's been really great uh, urban renewal uh, used in the positive way in downtown uh, Flint. And we stayed at um, the Hilton Garden Inn. It was a lovely place. I think it was uh, part of an old bank that had been uh, restored. And it was a beautiful, beautiful facility. Um, and as my wife and I were checking in, uh, the, the hotel clerk handed us a bottle of water. And I'm thinking, well, now, I've been in a lot of hotels with my wife. And I was thinking, uh, how frequently is it that almost at the same time as you're getting your electronic key, you're handed a bottle of water? And I didn't think anything more about that until after uh, the, the conference and I was driving home and I was sort of wondered, and I'd like to ask that question after your presentation, um, what does the symbolism of me getting a bottle of water in downtown Flint at a higher end hotel for free? So I'm not quite sure what to make of that, and maybe you'll, you'll, you'll shed some light on that. So without further ado, I'd like to please welcome Paula, Nick, and Troy from University of Flint, who will talk about their work in downtown Flint and how it intersects with water and our book. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, thank you, Chris, and thank you to our hosts. We're um, very honored to be here today. And um, we also thank you for being interested enough in choosing this book as, as one of your reads for your program. Um, I guess, you know, it's hard to know where to start with this, right? So in our office, we, we are the Office of Economic Development. Um, we do a lot of work with entrepreneurs of all ages and stages, as we say. We do a lot of applied research in our community. Um, we have a GIS center. Uh, we house community relations for our office. But I think you're probably most interested in some of our stories about the water crisis, right? And and I won't say a lot about what the residents of Flint went through. I'm going to leave that for Nick because he was born and raised in Flint. And, and you know, this is almost a little um, borderline traumatic for him, I would say, because it's been a while. Um, and I think he has some memories that have come to light, but he's very honored to be able to share some of his stories with you. And Troy Rosencrantz is gonna talk a little bit about some of the work he did mapping some of the pipes and then also helping to map some of the services that were provided. But just as a matter of kind of perspective, um, you know, think of it as, you know, a, a typical public health crisis, you know, for a different reason, obviously, this was a man-made crisis, as people would say. But, you know, you all went through the pandemic, right? So if you can think about those early days of the pandemic and how you felt and how much uncertainty there was and, you know, think about how people said, oh, it's not in the U.S., it's in another country. And then suddenly, oh, it's in New York. It's not going to come to Michigan. You know, you're OK. You don't need to wear a mask. And there's so many parallels between that and what the residents were told. So 
you know, the water's fine. Don't worry about the water. You know, you don't need to wear a mask. Everything's okay. And then think about that uncertainty you had because you, you believe in people, you trust people, whoever they are. And then suddenly you think, you know, who is it that I can trust and who can I trust? And that's not to say that, you know, some decisions were deliberate. It's just sometimes people didn't know better. Sometimes they did know better. Um, I had a personal experience because at the time I was sitting on the Grand Blank City Council, a suburb of Flint, and making decisions about, you know, our water and what we're going to do with it. And I sat there and I said to myself, I completely trust our public works department. But at the same time, you have this doubt in your mind that if, if you shouldn't be trusting somebody, you know, what should you do? So, you know, think of, again, think of the pandemic and how you felt during the pandemic. And I would say that's how, how a lot of residents in Flint felt. Right away, the university had to do something, right? And it was all hands on deck, but again, kind of chaos, just like it was during the pandemic, right? You wanted to help the people in Flint. You could, you would do anything you could to help them, but you weren't quite sure what it was you're supposed to do. So we were, you know, distributing water filters. We were going door to door, distributing water and filters and making sure people were okay. We were protecting our own students and our faculty and staff. We were thinking about our business owners in Flint who suddenly didn't know if they could use the water. Restaurants in downtown Flint and throughout Flint, you know, they lost customers because people weren't trusting the water, even if they said the water was bottled water. Um, we have a township outside of Flint, Flint Township, even those businesses suffered. So, you know, we have residents suffering, we have businesses suffering. And a lot of what our office is trying to do now is to try and repair some of that damage going forward. So we're doing our best. Um, but I'm going to leave it to Nick and Troy to talk a little more specifically about, for Nick, some of his personal experiences, and for Troy, some of the work he was doing um, in, in research and GIS. Thank you, Paula. Um, sure. And I'll, I'll tee up Troy here, because I think he has an excellent uh, answer to many of the problems that we were able to encounter and deal with. Um, but I'm going to give a little bit more context, if that's all right. Um, so the book, you know, what the eyes don't see, I think is so appropriate because it starts essentially in the middle of a crisis. Um, and it's from the perspective of a leader who comes from outside the community and notices a problem within a community and is able to take action, uh, despite, you know, professional issues or reputational damage is able to convince high holding stakeholders that this is important, that this is real and was willing to put her reputation on the line. And so, you know, as many people in Flint, incredibly grateful to the work Dr. Mona did, the way in which she put herself out there. Um, but I'll just be frank. I mean, this is an extremely complicated issue. It wasn't just lead in water and it didn't start in 2014. And so I'm just going to give a very brief kind of preamble to this water crisis. Uh, I was a community journalist from 2005 until 2017 doing hyper local news through East Village Magazine, a local nonprofit. Um, and I also was uh, able, graciously enough, to be able to start a theater company throughout this time, Shop Floor Theater. And what that was really focused on was documenting the local stories, the local issues, and there were myriad. Uh, so Shop Floor uh, was also one of these early uh, organizations that did verbatim theater. So as, like journalism, we actually used the quotes, the real words, the real context of what was going on. And we gave it theatrical life. We created uh, works. In fact, I have a poster behind me here. On the other side from our big work about emergency managers state of emergency where we documented everything all the way up to governor snyder in this time while flint was under emergency management between 2011 and 2013. so even before the issues related to the water we had already had a huge community effort both in education and advocacy regarding problems with these laws so very quickly um, the emergency manager laws in michigan have a bit of a, a history um, so again, to Chris's point, it's extreme austerity. We had an existing law, PA-72, that was enacted in 1990. And Flint had actually already gone through this process earlier with what was known as an emergency financial manager, someone with limited ability uh, to help right the wrongs and prevent potential bankruptcy for the city. The logic being that judges will do much more harm to a community uh, than an appointed manager that has some relationship to that community. Well. Long story short, as you guys may imagine, uh, the state of Michigan is a very divisive place, especially uh, around the 2008 crisis. 
very politically oriented uh, for right wing uh, conservative Tea Party influence, as the book states. Um, and places like Flint were some of the first uh, communities to really be affected by that crisis because um, you may be familiar with revenue sharing, but ultimately what caused all of these issues and gave the state kind of the green light to come into majority minority communities like Flint uh, was this threat of financial emergency. Well, the threat was created in 2008 when the state of Michigan had a deficit. And according to their constitution and their own logic as creatures of the state in our constitution, the cities really were there to support the state as a whole. And so they kept our tax revenue, uh, revenue sharing. They, they put it back into the state coffers and refused to dole it out to communities like Flint that really needed it to balance some long-term liabilities. Uh, Flint, as you may have realized in this story, had decades of pension liabilities, decades of infrastructure and other uh, kind of costs and very little new revenue, very little new tax revenue, you know, low paying jobs, a, a mass unemployment. Uh, and it really couldn't pay its own way without that tax revenue. So the state began after this 2008 process creating financial emergencies in communities um, like Flint uh, throughout the entire region. And so it also affected school districts and so throughout this, Detroit, Detroit school district were taken over, Flint school district, which went from 32 schools to now today, I believe we have five or six altogether, kept cutting uh, essentially to avoid takeover by the state where they were threatened with extreme austerity. Um, and so I want to give this context because I think it's really important to know that this struggle did not begin uh, when the water change occurred. It certainly was something that was a major issue for folks locally. And the law that was originally enacted in 1990 had been changed by this Republican-led legislature. It was drafted actually by the Mackinac Public Policy Institute, which is a lobbying organization here in Michigan. And what it, what it allowed them to do is go from emergency financial managers to emergency managers. The difference being quite stark. It allowed them to sell off city assets, which they did in Flint. They sold our tallest building for a dollar to uh, local investors. Uh, they were able to break union contracts as necessary with the logic uh, that basically these are some of the big liabilities that a community like Flint has. Um, they were also able to cut safety protocols. So we had an ombudsman office and kind of a similar one for our city workers. And both of those were immediately on the chopping block. And then beyond this, there was absolutely no accountability. So it's briefly touched on in the book, but we had a revolving door of unaccountable emergency managers, ultimately four plus Natasha Henderson, which was appointed by the RTAB, the Receivership Transition Advisory Board, again, state-led. So for the number of years that we were under emergency management, there was no local control. There was figureheads such as our mayor and city council that had no ability to act on their own and ultimately were cut uh, their salaries down to something that was below minimum wage. Um, and there was just a myriad of other issues that I could bring up. But this, this forced austerity, this environment uh, where everything matters, every dollar matters uh, to try to achieve some unrealistic goal from a problem that was created by the state uh, ultimately led to this water crisis. And the water crisis, again, is a, an issue that the city of Flint residents knew would, would be kind of coming. Uh, if you ever lived in the city of Flint, the industrial history, we knew that that Flint River had issues. It may not still be as polluted as it was in the 60s, 70s, um, or even the 80s, but we knew there was something off about it, and it certainly wasn't our desired uh, drinking water source. But there was no ability to make those changes, no ability to stand up and fight these things. In fact, uh, at a state level, I believe in 2013, uh, the voters had a voter enacted referendum to take down PA4, the emergency manager law. Well, a month later, our Republican led legislature put in PA 432, which basically was the same law. Uh, but they added a small referendum of, I believe, $100, which made it, or a small appropriation, excuse me, which made it referendum proof. So time and again, the folks that are supposed to represent our communities that literally say we know better and that we don't need a democratic approach to this, uh, we're completely going against the votership, completely going against the majority of people in the state um, and creating circumstances like what happened in Flint. Um, for $80 a day, we could have avoided this crisis. Uh, within the first months, people were complaining. We could have immediately taken action. As you know, it took more than a year and a half, and it really took folks outside of the community to bring this awareness um, and action to bear. And so I'd just like to give that small piece 
as a journalist, you know, throughout this process, I was getting the same lines from Howard Croft. I was getting these same individuals representing the government, giving us answers that quite frankly, no one was qualified in the city, including them to really provide. They didn't have a background in the utilities that they were working. They didn't have answers to basic questions. And there was a huge community outcry throughout all this that I think is somewhat lost in the book. Um, two years of at least community outcry. Folks like the Water Warriors, which are mentioned, the, before that, the Democracy Defense League led by Claire McClinton and Nayara Sharif. Um, so many different actions to try to bring attention to what was occurring in Flint and similar communities to a state and national level, ultimately falling on deaf ears. Um, so I'd just like to give that context before the water crisis occurred, because I think this is really the big lesson we need to take out of this, similar to the Kettering lesson in the book, right? Money is the reason this occurred. Greed is the reason this occurred. The othering of communities that don't have a political voice is the reason this continued. And I think, you know, for me, the biggest lesson out of all of this is the people that we could trust were the people that were sharing the experience, not these folks that, you know, went to Lansing at the end of the night, not these folks um, that were making the decisions, but people that were involved 24 seven in the consequences. And Nick, just just quickly also to add, I mean, I think a lot of the problem with the tax base resulted from GMs pulling out of Flint, right? So So there was already an issue because of the lack of Chris was talking about the lack of tax revenue, right? So infrastructure was failing for quite some time. Yeah, and I think that's a great lesson as well. You know, this was at one time the highest per capita income county in the country, even above Detroit. Um, and we had this this love, uh, this huge infrastructure that essentially we have a third of the population today to be able to continue. So even before we knew there was a lead and water crisis, there were more main breaks per square mile than in any community in the country. So that's a lot of lost water. That's a lot of potential E. coli and other bacteria getting into your drinking water supply. Um, that's a lot of cost for infrastructure redevelopment. And ultimately it helped to result in why Flint then and even today has the highest drinking water rates in the country. Um, much of that cost is lost to infrastructure. There's a service fee of approximately $100 a month just to keep your water on and your sewer. Um, so there's, there's still huge problems around all this. Um, and, and I'll just quickly add, you know, I think one thing that's important uh, is how this was uh, marketed, essentially, how the face of this problem was um, put out there into their larger world. There is a, a massive environmental injustice here, but when it's poor people that don't have a voice, when it's uneducated individuals, inarticulate individuals, people of color, it's much easier to consider them as some other group, you know, to other them. Uh, while I was reading this book, some of this stuff's 10 years old uh, and I had to stop, frankly, it was quite triggering because you, you try to normalize, you try to forget, especially when there isn't ultimately a solution to any of these problems. And we can talk about that later, um, but no one was prosecuted. Uh, no one has yet received a dollar in the city of Flint. None of the internal systems in any home have been replaced. And, and frankly, no one can really afford to do that. And the pipe replacements that did occur, uh, if you weren't paid up on your water bills, which again, highest in the country for a very impoverished population, if you didn't have an active water account, and if you didn't know how to use the system, you likely didn't get your 10,000 or more uh, pipe replaced. And so that's a cost that many people just can't bear going forward either. So there's just so many systemic issues that came from this choice, ultimately not to listen to the individuals that are greatly affected, the, the payers, the customers, if you will, um, and, and to kind of come into a community and say, I know best, right? I'm going to bring my education and my background and my bureaucracy and tell you what you need to do for yourselves. Um, so I, I do just quickly want to touch on a few things because I think some of the issues in the book are, are skated over. Um, so it wasn't just lead and water. We had a, a series of issues um, that people experienced. So the first, as I mentioned, was E. coli. Uh, which has obvious effects. Then to treat the E. coli, our water treatment center added uh, excessive levels of chlorine. Well, when you do that, that creates a carcinogenic byproduct called TTHM, uh, total trihalomethanes. And so many people were drinking this poisonous water then, and I'm sure for decades we're going to feel the effects of that. That was followed by, um, because it was so hard, it had so much corrosiveness in the water, 
uh, skin rashes. Many people had, you know, really horrific skin problems as a result of showering in the water, their children, you know, bathing in bottled water, some folks. Uh, the Legionnaire's disease, which isn't often talked about, thankfully was mentioned in the book, uh, which again, none of us knew what Legionnaire's disease was. There's no reason to. That is such a, a rare problem to have in a water system. But again, because uh, much of the community does not still use or didn't at that time use the pipelines, you know, many of these homes are empty. There's a lot of excess capacity. And so water would sit. It potentially would accumulate more uh, bacteria. And ultimately, it caused the death and the long-term harm of many individuals. Uh, and we only know about the ones, frankly, that were tested. You know, there's, there's quite a few other casualties of this crisis that were not counted. And then finally, of course, lead. And while the book, rightfully so, focuses on the 9,000 children, everyone is affected by lead. There is no safe level. There is no age at which it doesn't affect you. And it, as it says in the book, it, you can only test for it for 28 days, another loophole. Um, and so there were so many uh, poisoning by policy, so many uh, intentional acts that essentially tried to keep liability away from those folks that were the bad actors. Um, even the flushing criteria, we were told by the city and by the state to flush our water for five minutes before we did the testing. Well, that puts them in the clear. That certainly gets rid of all the lead, but I don't know about anyone here. If you ever turn on your faucet, you put the cup under as soon as you can, you don't let it run. So it's it, it, these types of behaviors, um, many of us even for years afterwards continued to brush our teeth with bottled water because the trust was completely eroded. And it doesn't matter if it's a local official, a state official, or even the EPA, at that point, none of them could be trusted by the majority of folks. And that trust today is still not there. And the consequences are still pretty evident to many of us. Um, I don't wanna monopolize the time, so just a couple small things. I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, but this, this kind of legendary figure that was mentioned in the book, uh, Bunyan Bryant, has unfortunately passed away just in the last week. Um, and so I just want to kind of, again, put out there that this is, a, I believe, a 63-year legacy of work fighting these kinds of issues, these, these very complex and difficult uh, to put into a byline, difficult to put into um, non-jargon that all of us can empathize with type of problems. And so uh, there's a proud legacy in this community of folks uh, that take up that same uh, mantle, including those democracy defense folks, the water warriors, including mothers who throughout this process had die-ins at the water plant where they would literally, uh, essentially a sit-down strike where they lay down publicly covered in red paint uh, to try to expose the infertility, um, all of the, unfortunately, all of the lost children during this crisis and the potential epigenetic problems all of us are going to face in the next generation. So I'll leave it there. I, I appreciate this. We'll speak more about uh, the business side uh, coming soon. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, so that kind of gives you, you know, a, a person's view that was there, obviously was very, very involved as Nick is always involved in uh, within the city of Flint. Uh, myself, I'm not from the, the area. Uh, you know, Nick's grown there. He went to school there still works there. Paul has been in, in Flint working at the university for many years. And I got here to Flint in about 2013. Um, so this was right before kind of, uh, you know, everything started to happen. Um, but to give you a little context, even before the water crisis happened, uh, myself and Dr. Marty Kaufman were, who was within the, it was Earth and Resource Science Department at the time, but he does a lot of urban water studies. He's kind of an expert uh, he ended up being on Rachel Maddow's show when she came to town. He was on many other national broadcasts, um, myself included with some of the data that I'll show you here shortly. Uh, but, um, you know, he had come up with the idea that, or not the idea for a research study that we were going to try to submit to a national inst or the NIH, National Institute of Health, um, where we were going to systematically understand how to go about replacing the entire water system within Flint. Uh, this is not an issue within just Flint. It's within all Rust Belt cities um, where a lot of it was built in the early 1900s, uh, especially as cars, you know, became more prevalent. Um, so this is 1920s, 1910s, 1930, a little bit. Uh, and a lot of these systems only have about 100 years lifespan. And that was coming up at about 2020. So uh, Dr. Kaufman was trying to kind of get out ahead of it. 
to have an education piece about it. All of this happened prior to September, October of 2015. Um, so we were already kind of hoping to, you know, help out with the water system, figure out, you know, find funding, um, do research on it, see where the bad parts are. As Nick mentioned, there was a lot of water main breaks occurring uh, that we had helped out the county health department with some mapping for that uh, prior. Even before the water crisis had broke, we did, I, I didn't think about it until I read it in the book, but I had actually helped the county health department map some of the Legionnaires cases um, across the city that, you know, looking at stagnant water, as Nick, Nick mentioned, when that water becomes stagnant in the pipes, it can help those bacteria grow. So we're looking at other forms of stagnant water, trying to figure out why those might be happening. Are they close to water main breaks? Are they whatever it might be? Uh, and as Dr. Mona alluded to, is that it was probably due to the water crisis itself. Um, so from that, uh, you know, when the water crisis first happened, um, you know, uh, you can pull up the presentation. I have some visuals. I'm a GIS guy. I'm a maps guy. Uh, so I want to make sure I show <laughs> uh, some visuals. Um, this is a talk that I've given um, to a couple other large users groups, uh, GIS users groups within the um, within Michigan. Uh, and so I just kind of pared it down with just to show some visuals, just to give you a better idea of kind of what happened after. Uh, and obviously with the presentation that I normally have given, I give background. Well, we've already gotten the background with the book that we read. Um, so basically kind of from our point of view, at least from a data person and a GIS person, how we can help. The problem has already happened. And unfortunately it did happen. And obviously with all the ill effects were being felt. Um, and so, what we wanted to do was figure out, well, we need to find out where this lead is. Um, and so we went to the city of Flint, uh, Dr. Kaufman, and then another GIS professor on campus, Dr. Greg Garvarchik, went to the Department of Public Works and find out what data they had. How did they, did they know what the connections were? Did they know what types of materials were being used? And there was two different types, one being index cards that were written in the 50s in pencil. And so, uh, a lot of that had been smudged over time, faded over time, and just weren't a very good source at all. And then the other one were maps of curb box locations, which is what you see um, there in the image um, throughout the city, parcel by parcel. And these were drawn on hand-drawn plat maps, uh, you know, survey maps uh, of the entire city um, in a book that uh, actually a couple years prior had um, been damaged in a flood within the city of Flint City Hall vault. Uh, luckily, they had scanned all of these images in, uh, so they were digital, which made it a lot easier. But um, luckily, it happened before that book ended up being damaged. Um, so there's two sides to it. There's a private side, which is the side uh, basically on your side of the sidewalk. And there's a side on the other side, which is the connection between basically the sidewalk to the main water main with that's usually under the street. Um, and so the one that's on basically your the house side of the, the sidewalk is the property owner's responsibility to change. Uh, and then anything that's between the sidewalk and the right of way area basically is the public's. And so um, what ended up being found, I'll explain in a second, um, but this is kind of what came up. These are the different types that were there, over 200 different images um, that we had to kind of look at and determine. Um, so we had a, a couple students test out some theories or test out some how to get these images into GIS get a map, what was the best process. Um, and so we got the data pretty quickly, but the contract wasn't actually agreed to until January of 2016, unfortunately. Um, so by the time the contract had, you know, basically saying, go ahead, let's do this, let's finish it. Um, the timetable was much, much smaller. And so we originally planned, you know, over a couple months trying to get this turnaround, but basically what ended up happening. And luckily I became full-time 40 hours a week the Monday that we got these eight people going. Uh, I'd previously only been about 20 hours a week, uh, part-time, basically grant funded at the time. Um, we had eight people for one week working eight hours each, uh, pretty much per day, um, to figure out how to you know get these points um, into a digital format so that we could use it to do other analysis type. Like I mentioned, they used it in the fall to kind of find two students to code the southern portion. This is what the map kind of looked like. Um, this is it all the way over. Basically, I had to stitch all, the, all 200 images together. It took me about 40 hours or a couple of weeks to do. Um, and then we had all the students go through 
Um, there was only so much accuracy I could get uh, with what is what's known as georeferencing, uh, basically taking you know an image and, and giving it a spatial data or spatial reference. Um, sometimes it worked great, like on the left. Uh, sometimes it wasn't as great like it is on the right. Um, but I got as close as possible uh, so that the students and the, and the workers uh, could do it. Um, There's 12 different codes. And so we looked at each of those individual codes. Uh, the ones that are highlighted have LC, which is that lead copper. And that's the basically meaning lead on the public side, copper on the private side. Um, galvanized steel, which was mentioned in the book as well, is also an issue. Uh, because if there is lead in the water, the galvanized will actually absorb some of that lead uh, and then pass it on to water that's not necessarily um, already uh, having issues or having lead within it. Um, so anything that wasn't copper was an issue. Uh, so parcel by parcel, uh, we went through and searched. As you can see, uh, there's about the, the time there was 55,000 different parcels within the city of Flint at approximately 32 square miles uh, within the city. Um, we did some Arabs checking. The students did fantastic work. I, I've always praised them. Um, as Dr. Mona has even said with her residents helping out with anything that she needed. Uh, you know, student, students or your, your coworkers can be huge uh, pieces of the puzzle um, to do that. And so these are the, the two main maps that we um, kind of came up with. On the left in red is where the lead locations were at. Approximately 4,300 locations out of those 53,000 were had a lead connection within the data. And again, that data was from 1984, and it hadn't been updated since then. So that means people that have money could have, you know, put it on, um, had fixed it themselves, um, or over time it could have just been updated throughout, you know, public works just going out and, you know, having issues and replacing it and changing it to copper, uh, especially after the lead copper rule took effect. Um, but then also we had approximately 5,000 galvanized locations. But a big piece was approximately 13,000 parcels didn't have any connection type on the, the maps. Um, so out of that, 11,000 of those were residential. Um, you know, the, some of the bigger pieces, for example, down, down the bottom left of that, the map with the orange is where GM is located. Uh, there's a large parcel right in the middle, kind of the northern side of the central portion of the city, uh, which is where Buick City is, uh, which is where the Buick factories were located at before the uh, Buick pulled out. Um, so that's why those look large and big areas. Those are just very large parcels. Um, but the, the big thing was that unknown was something that we we couldn't quantify. Uh, myself and Dr. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, uh, we couldn't decide, you know, it's we didn't want to estimate just the 4,300. We figured there had to be more, especially in those unknown locations or some of the data might just be wrong. Um, and uh, I'll show you an example uh, here in a second of why I say that. Um, but. We tried to look at a variety of different things, um, similar to Dr. Abernathy and Dr. Schwartz from University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, they created a website that kind of predictively modeled across the city where lead might be located at based on water lead levels, blood lead levels, and, and a variety of other aspects. We also looked at age of structure uh, because Flint is an old city. It was both mostly in the 20s, mostly in the 40s. Um, and for example, in an area that had a lot of lead uh, components, um, where the which are in red, uh, they were all built in the early 1940s. Uh, what was also going on in the early 1940s was World War II. And so a lot of the good metal or better metal uh, was being used to fund the war, to go towards the war. So lead was cheap uh, and lead was, a, was more readily available to be used to make these connections. Um, and so that's kind of what we found across the city is these houses that were built, not all, but most within these 20s and 40s were mostly the ones that were indeed led according to the data in 1984. Um, look at the density, just kind of the, there's areas all across the city, uh, but mostly in that kind of central western portion of the city. Um, but also in the eastern, had some hot spots, you know, in the southern and, and even up into the northern reaches. Um, so the last thing I wanted to show was, you know, with all of this, we shared all this data with what became known as the Fast Start Team. Um, and the Fast Start team was was led by uh, a retired Brigadier General Michael McDaniel, um, who was a, a law professor at Western Michigan University. He took over the lead of the team, as well as uh, some other National Guard contacts. We had many meetings at the state. Um, throughout this, we also met many times with, or not many times, I, I did meet Dr. Mark Edwards once, uh, maybe twice. 
Uh, we got his data. He happily shared that with us to kind of see if we could figure out a way to see if there, how much, what relation there was uh, between the data that he had collected and our the data that we had created. Um, but out of the first 34 digs uh, that happened uh, summer of 2016, if I'm not mistaken, um, 17 were correct. So, you know, right on. 11 were not the same. Um, whether that was what way it was, I can't remember exactly. But so 11 weren't correct based on that data. Uh, and six of the unknown in the records that they tested, three of them did have lead. So one was lead to lead, meaning lead on both sides of the curb box. Um, two lead copper, one lead galvanized, and then the other two were copper galvanized and galvanized copper. Um, so that kind of points to that fact where I was talking about the 11,000 um, you know, unknown parcels. They're finding out of the six that were unknown, half of them were lead. Now that could, obviously that's a very, very, very small sample size, but it kind of pointed to the fact that we still don't know how much lead this might still be underneath. I know they've, they've continued to do more and more. Um, as the process went on, uh, getting into 20, end of 2016, 2017, I made some maps, you know, for future projects that already were going to happen in terms of where a road was already going to be torn up to replace a water main, to replace whatever water or utilities it might've been. Um, so that while they were doing that, they could do the curb box, re uh, replacement at the exact same time. Um, so that was all kind of done at once. Um, a lot of these maps were you know, presented at, you know, the city of Flint, at the governor's office or the state. Um, and, and kind of from that, by the end of 2017, we kind of pulled back. It wasn't kind of in our wheelhouse anymore. We, were, we weren't asking for updates. We kind of just wanted to make sure that the university and our expertise with Dr. Kaufman and, you know, his expertise in urban watersheds um, and piping and, and all that sort of thing. And then it was myself and Dr. Uh, Rybarczyk's at GIS expertise, making sure we could, um, you know, go forward as, as fast as possible uh, because the city of Flint, uh, as Nick kind of alluded to of the, you know, not having that tax base, not having that money, they really haven't had a GIS program in a very long time. Um, and that was part of the GIS center being started in 2013 was to help out the city of Flint with their GIS needs. Um, and so because of that, we knew there might be a, a lack of capacity that we wanted to make sure we filled. Um, and so you can take that down if you, you would like. Um, that was the last slide. Uh, so, you know, from my perspective, uh, you know, somebody that doesn't live in Flint, but has worked in their last 10 years, um, the book, there's a lot that I didn't remember uh, or didn't even know to begin with, because for the most part, once I had no idea, obviously I mentioned we had kind of already talked about doing water grant. We'd already done some mapping of Legionnaires, but none of that had anything in my mind to do with the, the, water, the safety of water. Uh, within the city and so um, what the book and what Dr. Mona describes uh, about the activists and what Nick has described uh, I've seen firsthand many 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 times not only for um, the Flint water crisis but that's going on to the pandemic like Paula mentioned uh, of people being able to rally together and be resilient um, and you know that kind of was what was a big part of, of the city of Flint and being able to take on these challenges. They've been hit in the mouth many, many, many times and they are able to keep getting up. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to work with them uh, and help them as best I can in terms of uh, what I'm able to do. So. Thank you so much. Um, I have many questions myself, but before I ask questions, I'd like to turn to the audience and see if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, yes, please. <laughs> okay, I have so many, and I can't see behind me, so just throw something at my head, or you go like this. Do yeah, it, sure, absolutely. So first and foremost, how predominant, both in this area and nationally, are these emergency managers? Is this still local political rule type thing that we see, as opposed to democratically elected city, city commissioners, managers, et cetera? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean... Uh... Our guests from Flint. Yeah, I'll just quickly jump in. Uh, Michigan was very much the test bed for this, a purple state um, at a time when there was essentially all three uh, kind of government entities, the governor's office, the legislature were controlled by one party. Um, and it had, like I said, it was very Tea Party influence, very austerity politics influence. So Michigan was the test bed for this. I think similar laws to some extent exist in other Great Lakes states. 
But I really think that the the obscene failure here in Flint uh, will keep this from being nationally implemented. I mean, as it was said, Snyder was attempting to or considering running for the presidency. And you really would have seen this, I think, as a, a bellwether state uh, for those type of austerity politics nationally. Thank you. Another question. Uh, I didn't have a question. When I read the book, too, to me, the la the trust issue, as Nicola already alluded to as well, is going to be huge. And you say you're working on rebuilding the trust. And I'd like to know if can you share with share with us what some of the efforts are going forward to rebuild the trust and you know the CDC, the Department of Health, the government officials. So, yeah. so I could talk a little bit about that. Um, so, as a result of the water crisis, there was obviously some funding that did come into Flint to try and repair some of these problems. And we were the recipient of a Kellogg Foundation grant, the Flint Truth and Action Partnership Project. And the whole point of that grant that was managed through our office was to restore trust um, in government. We realized quickly that even pre-water crisis, even pre-emergency manager, we weren't sure in Flint if there was always a lot of trust in government to begin with. So, you know, we're working really hard with our community partners to restore that trust. But, you know, when you think about it, you know, I'm fairly heavily involved in local politics. And we like to think of local politicians as being the politicians we trust the most, right? So we have a mayor here tonight. Thank you for all of your service. I know how difficult it is. And, a retired know, mayor too. You had a you had a, a sitting mayor and retired mayor. Yeah. So uh, well, thank you because I know yeah. as a former local small town councilwoman how how difficult that is, and how close you feel to your constituents and how you don't want to let them down. Fact of the matter is, I've been in that position. You just hope you're not letting them down. Sometimes you might not know, right? You might be relying on numbers or an agency and hoping that they know what they're doing. And that's exactly what Mona, Dr. Mona's position was, right? Remember the point where she said, I'm, I'm the liberal, I'm the one who believes in government. You know, he's the one that's the Republican, you know, he's, he shouldn't trust government. So, you know, I, for me, that's, that was a big issue in this book is who do you trust and who don't you trust, right? And, and, I, and I, I would say, in my opinion, in Flint, there were a lot of actors that caused this to happen. I'm sure that, you know, for some people it was one person or maybe two people, but I think there were a lot of people at all levels who failed Flint in this case. And, mm -hmm. and it wasn't intentional. I mean, I don't think anybody's saying that somebody said, oh, I'm going to poison the people with bad water. Of course, that isn't what happened, but somehow it did happen. And I, I don't know how you restore that trust in any community. I mean, I guess I can bring that back to you and maybe one of your uh, mayor or, or former mayor. I mean, how do you work at that to make sure your constituents trust you? And how, how do you trust some of the information you're getting? I think our sitting mayor, uh, I think he had to dash to another event. Um, just to follow up though, you, um, you, trying to reinstill trust in, um, local, state, and federal government. I mean, the, all three levels of government took a hit in the book. Um, and so I was prompted to look at um, the Environmental Protection Agency website, you know, and of course there's a search function there. So I typed in uh, environmental justice. And of course it brings up just a ton of materials and grants. Um, and then I uh, typed in uh, uh, Michigan uh, DEQ and all it would bring up was Mississippi. So it turns out that uh, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality has changed its name. Mm -hmm. So uh, a rebranding uh, seems pretty interesting. Um, I don't know if you would care to talk about the rebranding, uh, but I would. But I did notice that there was a lot of information, even um, at the state level in Michigan, about environmental justice. So uh, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about progress, I suppose, uh, have things changed in terms of the government trying to be more responsive to environmental justice issues? 
if I may jump in here um, quickly. So the MDEQ uh, was a bureaucratic organ of the state. Uh, and so even before the water crisis, their main, and it's, it's uh, listed in the book, but their main concern was allowing new permitting uh, for companies. So fracking was a major issue in Michigan before this, we're a water rich state. Um, and ultimately this became the same issue. It's, it's covering up the issues and liabilities created by bad policy. Um, but another piece I think that's vital to the work that we've done, especially in my work with local nonprofits and businesses, um, is we, we listen to people. And this is something that it seems very novel, but it's something that wasn't done for many years. Uh, we found that many people just did not feel historically, you know, based on red lines and other kind of other class and racial issues, uh, they didn't feel comfortable coming downtown even to our campus, to our offices to receive services. Um, and so, you know, we're always striving to remove these barriers. So one of the programs we initiated in 2016 with local foundation funding uh, was what we call In on the Road, where we took our services to these trusted community centers, churches, kind of neighborhoods that really were in need and where folks maybe didn't have transportation downtown. Maybe they didn't feel comfortable or welcome downtown. How do we then meet people where they're at and focus on the problems that they're really interested in, the social ventures that will put a laundromat in their neighborhood, that'll put a restaurant and allow them to serve folks within that walkable range. So that was the first major effort. And we were able to carry that through 2020. Uh, obviously, COVID caused issues there. And just in the last two years, uh, we were very lucky to be part of a uh, spoke program with the city of Flint at the helm, uh, funded by the SBA, the Community Navigator Pilot Program. Unfortunately, it's not been refunded uh, by the, the federal legislature, but the idea was, again, how do we find those folks that are underserved, that do not feel like they are ever welcomed into these positions, and how do we get them directly connected as our hub with the city of Flint and rebuild that trust? Let them know who they're even supposed to talk to at the city to get something done. How does a business licensing, a site permitting go? Um, and I think we made great strides. We're actually one of uh, several that were lauded by uh, the White House. And we just had some federal folks come and visit Flint uh, as a result of this great work. So we're making strides and all of it's locally initiated. And I think that's the biggest piece is we have to rebuild from the ground up. Uh, there's still not a lot of trust, especially in the, the previous administration at the federal level. Um, and I have a few other thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll let Paula maybe join in. No, I, I, I think it's true. I mean, Nick in particular has spent a lot of time building that trust and meeting with people. And we have a lot of uh, faculty and staff at the university. All of our team has done that. Um, so, so that matters. And I really think that, you know, at the local level, I mean, Nick knows this better than I do, but do you feel like at the local level, Nick, there's more trust than there was before? It's a great question. I, I think um, the book really well states this dichotomy of being in and of Flint. Mm -hmm. And I think you trust uh, what you can feel. You trust what you can see and touch. You don't necessarily trust someone's word at this point, especially someone that may have an ulterior motive, a political motive. Mm -hmm. I think the folks that are really building trust are of the community and they've put in that time for folks to trust their opinion. I mean, this, this community is smaller by the day. I think about eight people move out uh, consistently each day. If you think about the stats, we're down from 100,000 to approximately 85 right now. Um, and so it's a smaller town by the day. And the folks that have a strong reputation, they're the ones that are the community leaders still. Um, one thing I just want to quickly touch on is as a journalist, one of the things I was very proud of is in this time where we could not trust government, uh, we couldn't trust the EPA, we frankly couldn't trust the MDQ or the state at any level. And the local bureaucracy, as you saw with Wallen and others, was really under question. Um, I, was, I was really glad to be able to provide a solutions journalism aspect. So one of the articles that I wrote during this crisis was informing individuals how they can test their own water line, a scratch test, whether it's lead, whether it's galvanized or copper. So before the, the state, the federal government, before um, really the mapping exercises were developed, we had people doing those tests, verifying themselves physically what their at least home side of the infrastructure looked like. So I'm very proud of that. And the, the last thing I just want to add quickly um, is a notion that Dr. Mona brings up the book that I think is so important. And it's about rebuilding trust. It's that we don't have to be uh, angry crusaders, although that doesn't hurt sometimes. 
Sometimes we can take a very different approach and kill them with kindness. She describes a hug diplomacy, I believe it was. And I didn't until I've read this book, and I've had this book for years, and I never had a chance to really re-engage with it. I didn't quite understand an experience I had had with Dr. Mona. Um, so just very quickly, um, one of the things that I did in 2015 as a citizen, um, really without confidence in our local government, without confidence in our state government, uh, was I was part of a local letter writing campaign, believe it or not. Uh, and we wrote to the White House independently, kind of a social media driven piece that says, whoever you are, if you're in the city of Flint, let's communicate our needs to the highest level possible. And so I was one of those individuals that wrote to the White House, um, really just a casual uh, email regarding my lack of trust and hope that some federal intervention can happen. This is also, if you're familiar with Little Miss Flint, the eight-year-old, she was another one of these letter writers that was lauded for just her bravery and ability to stand up to this injustice, even at such a young age. Uh, well, long story short, uh, I was very blessed to be able to join um, several constituents, including Dr. Mona, actually, um, at Northwestern High School uh, when President Barack Obama was, came to the community. Um, and so, you know, just a couple quick pictures of that that I, I felt, I, I think, really help describe the energy and the feeling that we had even at the very end of his presidency in uh, summer of 2016, what the possibilities were from this kind of individual, this protest-driven, activist-driven work. Um, so in this picture, I'm, I'm there on the left. You have a mother whose children were affected. You have a gentleman who uh, runs, at that time, the water distribution at Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is a, a Spanish-speaking church locally for some of our communities. And the gentleman on the far right uh, ran a Baptist church, North Central Baptist Church here uh, in kind of one of our, our northern communities. And, and you'll see us in these pictures drinking water with the president, um, something that I don't think anyone in the room was comfortable with, something that he was he was very casually able to convince us, had some, some relevancy, some hope that there might be change coming. Um, this is kind of the final picture, and you see Dr. Mona front and center. And, and what I love about this, back to the hug diplomacy, is while this group of individuals, including, like I said, thought leaders, pastors, uh, the gentleman just to the left of Obama is a union leader that offered their services for free as a, a plumbing union to go and replace faucets and uh, infrastructure in people's homes. You have a student leader on the far right next to the pastor and a local nun. Um, but the beautiful thing of, of all these people being brought together, individuals that otherwise are not often very uh, organized, politically savvy, folks from across very different walks of life, all came together because we recognized that all of us had a voice that mattered, whether we've ever been in a position where our voice had mattered previously. And while we're waiting, uh, just this quick anecdote, while we were waiting for Obama in the library of Northwestern High School, a, a local high school that had closed just previously to this, again, due to forced austerity and threat of takeover by the state, all the water fountains had bags over them saying toxic, do not drink. Um, and we're all very hyped up. And we're in this room with uh, an attache to the president. And Dr. Mona is as exuberant as you might imagine, as, as kind of full of life. And she very excitedly asked the attache, uh, can I hug the president? And they're like, please do not just hug the president. You know, that's a, it's a secret service type of issue. Uh, but very excitedly, she, she asked again. Um, and long story short, I, I believe that message got back to him because as he walked in the room, he flung off his suit jacket and gave every one of us a big hug starting with Dr. Mona. And I think that that right there, the ability to connect with the most powerful man in the world, someone that represented hope to all of us, uh, whether again, our politics or even just in the instant of being heard and understood was so valuable. Um, and again, you know, the election changed things. The next administration really didn't focus on this issue as much. But I like to point to this moment uh, where we really felt like we were doing something great by literally just standing up and, and trying to bring voice uh, to this issue that for years our community had been ignored. So I just I wanted to share that because I think that at the end, you know, there's a lot of systematic issues. There's a lot of uh, related to these larger policy discussions. But what mattered and what I think is what's translatable is that the smallest actions can make the biggest difference. And a, a, a group of folks independently writing off letters to the White House somehow we're able to get through, I'm sure, thousands and thousands of other concerns directly to the president, which helped inform the ultimate emergency that was declared for the community.
government. Uh, the, the one sort of representative of government that comes off very well is higher education. And so um, full disclosure, I work in higher education. So I really enjoy the fact that uh, uh, both Michigan State University um, and the University of Michigan, um, and now you as a, a branch of the University of Michigan are, um, you know, it, we're a driving part of that uh, um, resolution, if you will, or at least quest for a solution. So anyway, uh, I'm mo partially tongue in cheek as higher education being heroic, but um, it did get me thinking about science as also being sort of a heroic, it's hard to, hard to make science. Usually the scientist is the mad scientist is the bad guy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, uh, the scientific method, the commitment to science uh, was, you know, such an important part of the story. Um, and is that a story that continues uh, sort of a commitment to, to scientific rigor uh, or is that, uh, was that just a moment? No, yeah, I would, I would say it, it still is. Um, coming out of uh, the water crisis, uh, an entity was kind of formed called the Healthy Flint. Oh, shoot. Now I can't think of it. Paul, my research, research coordinating center. Thank you. My mind blanked in the R. Um, and it was a kind of a between those three universities that you just mentioned, Chris, uh, a, a relationship between those three plus community members. So there was a community panel. Um, that basically, like Dr. Mona mentioned many times about IRB approval, uh, for anybody coming to the city of Flint, which there were very, very, very many, um, that everybody wanted to do research on Flint. I, for example, I just got an email, and I'll grant it was from somebody from uh, Ann Arbor, but I get emails probably once every three months from, you know, thesis uh, students or PhD students or other researchers that want to do research on this water crisis and other potential ill effects or causes or, you know, what's happening now sort of thing. And I, so I still get requests from that data now. Um, but what was happening is that there were so many requests for data for the city of Flint, um, for other institutions, whatever it might be that as university, um, higher education people, uh, the, this kind of group was formed, um, to help combat that and make sure the science that was being done was being done correctly and uh, making sure that it was being done with the community in mind, because what was ended up happening was every week, the every you know resident was getting knocked on the door to fill out another survey um, huh. and fill out another survey and fill out another survey. Uh, and so, you know, this group created, you know, not only the three universities as a whole with representatives from each university, but also this community based research organization, um, which they had to give final approval uh, in order for that research to be able to happen. So it was like IRB, but it wasn't an actual, um, I guess, institutional type review board. It was more of a community review board with a lot of community leaders that, you know, may, a couple of them did work for the different universities or had worked for the un different universities. There were trusted voices that Nick kind of mentioned. Um, they're still leaders to this day. And uh, so that was kind of one piece where they wanted to make sure that what was happening uh, was going to attract a lot of attention from not only obviously everything that it did, but also these researchers that do want to help, but they also want to help in a different way, get published because you know, it was a hot topic type of thing. And, and so with that and the formation of this group, um, it, it allowed for the scientific method, as you mentioned, and that to kind of continue to be prevalent and making sure that no one was just coming in doing eh, science and then going out and publishing results that uh, for things that might not be great. Um, and so it, I, I don't want to say they, they wanted to control the narrative, but they wanted to make sure that things were doing being done properly uh, within the city and, and especially in the time that all these residents were so raw and, um, you know, sad and, uh, you know, from this experience and tra traumatized that they aren't re-traumatized over and over and over and over again um, when, you know, they might be asking the exact same questions, but it's a di researcher from a different university sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of what, at least an example I could think of off the top of my head. That's that's great. Thank you so much. Um, any, yes, Kim. I, um, to follow from that, the Heroes of Your Science, our academy, free press, right, clearly mm -hmm. journalism, all 
heroes in this narrative are also simultaneously under attack currently. So where, for those of us that are concerned about that, where should we be keeping our eyes? Where is the next crisis or what is the next crisis where these heroes are going to be needed, but maybe aren't as empowered as they were 10 years ago? Just uh, from my point of view, you know, there has been a consolidation and it all goes back to money, but there has been a consolidation as I'm sure all of us know of media. Uh, there's been quite a few folks uh, that are more affluent that have purchased uh, media power in order to potentially to get rid of, you know, people talking bad about their their business interests, such as I'll, I'll put up Twitter, you know, the consolidation of traditional newspapers. My background is in community news. And the reason that it's hyper-local, the reason that the most functioning governmental bodies are neighborhood associations, there are small, small groups of individuals within our uh, religious communities is because, you know, quite frankly, these are the stories of how a community moves forward. A city is not just uh, the actions approved by a city council, the budget set out for a governmental unit. It is the life and the quality of life of the individuals and the way in which they're able to interact and manipulate their environment. Um, so journalism is always under an attack. And I think the, the way to resolve this is to continue to find those human stories, those unseen stories, those unheard stories that really make a difference day to day, neighborhood to neighborhood, and especially in communities like Flint, where the trust in government has been lost for far beyond the life of emergency management, right? 20, 30 years of dysfunction. Um, I think at some level, we always need to be hyper vigilant when uh, people try to simplify narratives, when they try to remove context uh, in order to give a very easy explanation or a very um, non-empathetic understanding of the world. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Janice. About uh, studies, you talked about scientific methods. Uh, what is what kind of studies are being done of the students and the effect on the student the last ten years of this crisis? Paul, do you? I, I for the most part, on my end, I know that they had talked about it. Mm -hmm. You know, using this group of students, especially, you know, at the Flint school, about tracking, kind of using them as a cohort and kind of seeing their test scores and, and things going through. But I'm not sure if that actually went, you know, happened sort of thing. I know it was talked about initially, but uh, Paul, I don't know if you have any other. I, I'm not sure. I, I assume it's ongoing, but I don't know, Nick, if you're aware of that either. But I think that was the plan with some of that money that came into the Community Foundation, Greater Flint, correct? Yeah, so uh, there is a set of money. It was mentioned the Flint Kids, Flint Kids Fund uh, with our community foundation. I believe it had a $20 million kind of fund achieved. They were going for $100 million at one point. And that money stays with that cohort of children that were zero to five uh, during the height of the water crisis. And so as they age up, they're currently, I think, closer to uh, 12 to 14. You know, any activities that are relevant to their betterment, uh, that money is allowable for. Uh, I think the larger issue is, as the book said, you know, before this, there wasn't even really one full time school nurse in the community school system because of austerity politics, because of these same forces at the state level that really had no interest in caring race to the bottom. We supposedly got 10. Uh, but as you might assume, as COVID arose, as other issues came up, uh, we're back in a deficit where we've lost those wraparound services that were guaranteed initially in a state budget. Uh, as other things became top news and as essentially the national attention was lost for Flint. Um, and I think that that is unfortunate. And I, and I really hope that some of the available ARPA dollars today can fill those gaps. But again, that money is a one time. So the, the studying of children, I think, continues. Dr. Mona's clinic continues to serve uh, those youngest individuals, the Flint registry, which is mentioned in the book is really, I think the biggest source. And ultimately what they're continuing to do is surveys. They'll incentivize folks $50 at a time uh, to take these surveys and they follow them essentially every six months. And I'm part of that as well. Uh, but I don't know that there's a lot of independent work in the community schools at present with that population. Thank you. Any, any other questions? 
Um, I had a, maybe a couple of more questions. I'm gonna be uh, respectful of everyone's time. Um, I guess one of the challenges that as I was reading the book was, I mean, in a sense, Flint was a company town. Um, and uh, then there was Auto World as they were in decline, they, they were still trying to uh, build off the, uh, but what are some of the, so presumably then if Flint had, well, one of the thoughts I had was if Flint hadn't been quite such a company town with General Motors dominating everything, you know, could there have been a, a different outcome? And is there a message about a diversification of economies? Is that a, is that a, and I'm assuming that in some way that's what the uh, EDA grant at the University of Michigan Flint is about economic diversification to improve community well being. Is, is that, do I get that? Is that a synopsis, I suppose, of what your mission is? I would say so. And I think you've got that right. I mean, so a lot of this was, as as Nick said, a failure of government and, and the emergency manager situation. But as I also pointed out, I think it also is related to what you're referring to and our reliance on one single industry for so long. I don't think we had the foresight as a community to think about what would happen if that one industry went away and the tax base that goes along with it. You know, they also, in the book, Dr. Mona talks about, you know, at one point Flint wanted to also encompass some of the suburbs and the suburbs didn't want that. But I mean, I think that's naturally what has happened in so many locations, right? Um, she also references Auto World and I actually worked at Auto World. So um, <laughs> Auto World has a bigger story actually. And the story of Auto World it, is it was meant also to be a workforce development program. So everybody who worked at Auto World was trained for several months in, you know, cooking and, you know, customer service. And so I think there was a bigger story to Auto World that even as a college student, I wasn't aware of. Um, but yeah, so I really think that that was a big part of the problem that, that caused these infrastructure issues to happen to begin with. And obviously it was made worse as a result of everything else that happened simultaneously. But um but I think you're on to something there. The result maybe could have been different. But, you know, we're not unlike so many other big cities, right? So we're not, as you know, we're not the only city that had a water pro problem. But, you know, if you go somewhere, I was recently in the fall, I was in Utah and I wore my U of M Flint hoodie. And the whole airport was asking me, you know, if I came to Utah for better water. So, wow. um, so we're still living with that. It, it used to be... Um, Roger and me, yeah. you know, people thought of Flint as, as that documentary. Um, and now it's water. And I think we're really, we, we need to realize the, the impact of the water crisis. But I think, you know, Nick, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think we're also trying to be optimistic and figure out how we can create a path forward. Nick, I don't, I don't know what you want to say about that. You are the resident. So Cer certainly. And I guess, uh, the EDA, uh, university center, we really are focused on a few different pillars. One of them of course is workforce development. The other uh, is, is frankly, small businesses. The majority of folks in this country that are employed, it's not one large manufacturer. I mean, at one time, 80,000 direct jobs in the city of Flint of a population of approximately 200,000 where high paying GM manufacturing jobs and all the secondary industries, the tertiary industries, we're all fueled by that. Um, today, the, the biggest, and you know this, if you think statistically for the United States, and it's true in Flint, the biggest job creators are small businesses between one and five jobs. And so really my work has centered on how do we fulfill those gaps and those needs that the community has, that the community is still willing to, to pay for and, and fuel uh, but also create job opportunities, create economic well-being, create a tax base that is able to sustain itself. One of the beauties of our EDA Center is it breaks down traditional boundaries. Many of our, um, we're, I'm 100% grant funded, many of our traditional philanthropics, um, they think in terms of city limits, they think in terms of county limits. Well, this federal funding, this designation that we have is a seven county region. I'll put my Michigan map here. It's the entire thumb uh, our county here, Genesee, and the adjacent Shiawassee, a, a large portion of the state, a two-hour kind of round-trip region with a diverse population, urban, rural, suburban, exurban. Um, and so part of our mission is also to break down those artificial boundaries, those perceptional boundaries that have kept people isolated, have kept people separated for so long. 
Um, and so, you know, we've made strides working through SEDS plan development, uh, you may be familiar with, working kind of just with the economic developers in these different communities and trying to find those, those projects, whether it's through a GIS study, whether it's an economic development study or anything in between, where we can work in concert, create supply chains, create new money and new interest in these, uh, these just traditional places that we really haven't been able to get out of our own city, out of our own kind of artificial barriers from. Now, interestingly, that's the kind of, um, much of rural America is dependent on one industry, agriculture. And so the question is what happens when it goes away? Well, it's not going away, but there's fewer and fewer people. So economic diversity is, is uh, like you, that's sort of the uh, thing that we're, uh, we're sort of look, looking at. Um, Another point I was sort of interested in is is uh, the well regional government and uh, I've been I've been following what's been going on in uh, Jackson Mississippi I suspect you are as well uh, which is the similar situation of a core city minority population with water issues uh, that's experienced white flight and they can't manage uh, a decaying um, overbuilt infrastructure and so you know the, the idea of regional government. Uh, you know, it would, I, I wish that we had sort of been prescient enough many decades ago to sort of have that as a paradigm for local government. And unfortunately, um, it is not. Um, any other questions? Uh, by the way, we also have a city administrator here. I should have pointed that out. Um, so, in, so he also understands uh, painfully uh, well the challenges of, uh, you know, what the eyes can't see, which is to say the water lines. Uh, um, and so it's, it's, it's uh, great that, that, uh, um, that Scott is here. Um, if, if I can quickly just speak to your, your regional statement, I think there's a, a counterpoint to that. And I, Michigan has a great example, and that is the water system itself. Uh, so Detroit was also under emergency management, again, controlled at the same point at the governor's office. And uh, not to be a conspiracy theorist, but if you look at the simplest answers, what really occurred throughout these two emergency managements uh, was the Detroit water payers biggest customer was the city of Flint, still is based on distance, based on capacity, um, and they were doing just fine. Well, as soon as you take us off of their system, which was done, again, not by a, a democratic process, but by emergency manager Fiat, uh, they lost the ability to manage their financial system. And so then what happened was it was regionalized and that political power mm -hmm. that still existed for the city of De Detroit, that monetary source of stability was taken away and they became one of several seats where the suburbs, small suburbs had the same power in enforcement and policy making as the Detroit system. So it became a regional system and then ultimately we were put back on that system. So we're still funding them throughout all of this. And I think that's something that's not often talked about is the the regionalization sometimes can be done at uh, to, to take away assets of these traditional urban centers. Right. That's uh, great. Thank you. Uh, one, I was going to make one final comment. Um, there was a nice section in the book about wraparound services and talking about Jane Addams and the Hall House and how many, many, many decades ago people had thought about um, you know, social issues are not a, a, a single facet or not a single variable solution and that we, we have to think multi-dimensionally, if you will, to resolve these. And so it, um, I had a, I've had a sense that uh, what the University of Michigan Flint is also doing is in a sense kind of wraparound services. You're doing GIS, you're doing, um, you know, sort of uh, natural physical sciences, but you're doing workforce development. Uh, so uh, it's really great to see that uh, that. Um, sort of holistic approach uh, put into action. And so I think you should be congratulated. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. So what I'm, I'm just gonna wrap things up and say thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure having visited Flint last year, Paula, and I wanna say thank you so much for all the great work you continue to do, Nick and Troy. And uh, I'm gonna just sign off and maybe hand it back to uh, Janice to, or, uh, or Sue, is, or are we just going to say good night? We're gonna we're gonna clap our hands is what we're gonna do. <laughs>
and the whole book focus on this book it makes makes our one book one community project so much more meaningful i think because there are so many perspectives that you brought to it and i think we'll be doing that as we go through the month with our other activities so thanks a whole lot for the time and energy and yeah you guys are awesome thank you so much <laughs>